The race to succeed Nicola Sturgeon as SNP leader and First Minister features three candidates. It has another four weeks to run, but so far the contest has been overshadowed by controversy and division. Aged 48, Ash Regan is the one contender who's not currently serving in government. She was first elected to Holyrood in 2016 and became Minister for Community Safety in 2018. But she resigned last year in opposition to the Gender Recognition Reform Bill. In this election, she says she is someone who can unite the SNP. She spoke to us from Edinburgh. Ash Regan, what do you stand for? So I want to bring a new direction to the SNP. I think we need to unite the party and also unite the Yes movement. And we need somebody that can carry the country as well. So how are you different from the, the other two candidates who are standing? What makes you, what makes you stand out? I haven't really, uh, you'll forgive me, but I haven't really spent an awful lot of time um, watching the campaigns of my colleagues. Um, I would say that obviously they'll have their own idea about the way they do things. I would say that I'm definitely not, um, you know, headquarters, SNP headquarters choice. I'm clearly the outsider in this contest. So I'm trying that bit harder to make an impact. So how would you be different from, say, uh, Kate Forbes? Some people might see Hamza Youssef as being, as you describe it, the party candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, what would distinct, make you distinct from Kate Forbes? Well, I think there's many people would agree that we've seen some issues uh, in the SNP and the parliamentary parties over the last wee while. We've had issues over gender recognition, for instance. So I think we need to draw a line under some of these issues and move forward as a party, and I believe that I am the person to do that. So the main thrust of your campaign is uh, making Scotland independent. That, that's been first and foremost for you. So mm -hmm. how do you go about achieving that? Yes, so I think we need to remember that although obviously uh, the country will have an interest in who becomes the First Minister, that this is primarily an internal party contest and we are speaking to the members of the SNP. And clearly if you're a member of the SNP, that means that you're very interested in Scotland governing itself. I think that we are in a, an interesting position right now in terms of independence. Obviously, uh, we've got about half the country, or roughly about half the country are for and half the country are not convinced as yet. I think we have been seeing a situation where the SNP has been winning election after election after election. We consider that to be mandates to ask for a referendum. But obviously the UK government has said that they, they wouldn't allow a referendum. They wouldn't allow us a referendum really in any circumstances. So my plan, and I will say at the moment it is just a plan, I want to take this to the SNP conference. I want to have a discussion with our own members about whether we think this is right. But it's the idea is looking at where we are right now and then seeing if we can see a way through this. So most countries that have become independent from the UK or the British Empire, of which there are quite a lot now, I think it's um, around about 65, um, have demonstrated that through rising popular support. And one way you can do that, obviously, is through the ballot box. So I think maybe we need to move on from the idea of referendums, of process, um, get back to governing wisely. And under this plan, um, Scotland themselves will tell us when it's time for independence. Is that not what Nicola Sturgeon was saying, though? She said the next election, general election, Scottish election, would be a de facto referendum. Is that not what you're talking about? No, it's different to that, because if you think about it, a de facto referendum is a single issue at a single occasion, and this is, is not what I'm suggesting. So what would a mandate be for you, then? Well, I think it would actually be a clear instruction from the Scottish people. So what I'm putting forward, that is at each and every election, if um, pro-independence parties, so it could be just the SNP or it could be other independence parties as well, would have on the first line of their manifesto um, so that people know exactly what they're voting for. And if we get 50% plus one, we would consider that to be a clear instruction from the people of Scotland to open negotiations with the UK government. And that's not a de facto referendum? No, it isn't, because a de facto referendum is fought on a single issue at a single time. What if, as has been happening all the time, the Westminster government say, no, now is not the time? Yeah. So the Westminster government says a lot of things that they later go back on. I don't need to tell you that. Um, in all the cases that I outlined, so you know I was talking earlier about the 65 countries. So in all those occasions, at first, the UK government were not keen. They refused permission. They said that it, you know, it wasn't OK. But um, due to international pressure, they later succumbed to that and um, those, those countries all got to um, have their, um, you know, got to govern themselves. 
So what would that international pressure be? Can, can you give us an idea what countries would support you in this? Look, I'm not going to get into that at the moment. We're dealing with the situation that we're going to approach the next election in this way. And I think we need to, when we get to that point, we can look at that then. But you are asking people to support you. By, and you, one, of, one of the things you're saying is you're citing other countries, but you can't tell us who would support this approach. Yes, because uh, at the moment I can't read into the future. I'm not a fortune teller and neither are you. But what I'm saying is that there is a position, obviously there's the UN Charter, there's Article 1.2, and that is respect for self-determination. So there, there will be, you know, Scotland's choices will be recognised internationally, and I, I do expect that that will play into the UK government's decision making. And also, if you think about it, this is democracy in action. I don't think the UK would have a legitimate right to refuse Scotland. People have made that argument. The UK government is still saying, nope, it's not happening. So I, I'm just trying to boil down what happens if the UK government just keeps saying no. Well, they've been doing that so far, haven't they? So if you look at the, what they've been doing at the moment, what they're trying to do through refusing Scotland a referendum is to stop Scotland expressing its will. So if we move past that and we let Scotland express its will at the ballot box in the way that I've just outlined, then I believe that the UK government would have a moral imperative to listen to that. And if they don't think that, <laughs> you see what I'm getting, you, you see the point. If they say, no, we don't have a moral imperative. I know, but I've just outlined to you that in 65 different occasions that they started off saying no and then they said yes. So, you, so you, I'm dealing in reality here. Uh, well, are you? OK, you, you say you're dealing in reality, but OK. Um, how many elections might that take? This could take a long, long time. Well, this is the point. So it said each and every election. What I, I think is good about this is that we can stop talking about referendums. We can stop talking about the process. And we can clearly give this back to the people of Scotland, which um, rightly is where it absolutely belongs. This isn't about Westminster or what politicians at Westminster think. And it's not even really about what I think about this. This is about what the people of Scotland think and whether they think they're ready for independence. So under this, we can concentrate, and that would be my job as First Minister, concentrate on governing the country wisely. And when we do that, we're building trust in um, the Scottish Government, and that makes people comfortable in the, in the thought that Scotland could go on to run its own affairs successfully. And in doing so, that will give people the comfort, it will make them feel confident enough to vote for Scotland to become an independent country. Uh, extrapolating that, though, what if Scotland was an independent country and it works out the way you want it to, and then things don't work, quite work out as an independent country? Uh, would unionist parties then be able to say, if we get a majority, we go back into the UK? Well, that's up for the unionist parties to put that forward as their position. But you wouldn't disagree with that? You would see the principle of that being fair? I think the unionist parties are entitled to argue um, a political point just the same as I am. I think that's a fair process. Uh, you've spoken about working with pro-independence parties. Uh, the other pro-independence party in Scotland are, of course, the Greens, and you've been fairly dismissive, dismissive of them. You've been talking about the tail wagging the dog and, and such. Uh, you're opposing much of what they have uh, pushed through in the, in the Scottish Government. You, you really don't like the Greens, do you? Um, I actually do really like There's many members of the Greens that I do like. What I'm saying is that the SNP got 45% of the vote at the last election, and the Greens got 4%. And obviously, they are our coalition partners under the current arrangement. And what I've said is that I would, of course, sit down and talk to them and see where we could go with this if I become the leader. However, I have seen in the press some reports of the Green Party saying themselves that they would consider myself being the leader to be a red line for them, that they don't agree with some of the positions that I've taken on things. And obviously, that's up to them. But I would like to sit down and have that conversation with them. Would you be dismayed if they didn't follow you and were not part of the government anymore? I wouldn't. I think I'd be quite confident in being able to take the government forward. I've worked in a, a minority government before, and I'd be happy to do that again. What about another pro-independence party, Alipa and Alex Salmond? Would you be happy to bring them back into government with you? Well, they don't have any seats in the Scottish Parliament No, indeed, Parliament but in a, in a future election, if they did? If they did, of course. I will work with any pro-independence party. Indeed, I will work with parties that are not pro-independence. I am concentrating, you know, if I become the First Minister, I think 
we need to get back to the priorities that the Scottish people have for Scotland. So that's things like the NHS, the cost of living crisis, the economy. We need to be focusing on that. And I would like Parliament to focus on those issues. So I will work across the Parliament in order to do what's right for the people of Scotland. On well, this programme, uh, Hamza Youssef uh, spoke about the SNP Chief Executive Peter Morell as a proven winner, he said. Uh, why would you want to get rid of somebody like that? Well, he's been in post for some time now. I think in a corporate setting, it would be very unusual, and I think it would be frowned upon, to have a husband and wife team at the top in that way, uh, especially if you think about the contest that's, that's carrying on at the moment. I suppose the way to look at it is, what would you think if Carrie was counting the votes for Boris's successor? Um, just remind us tonight then, just in terms of support, um, how many of your own MSP colleagues have endorsed you? So I haven't had anyone publicly come out to support me, but I do have some private support, and I'm hoping that um, some of them will go public in the next wee while. And, and if they don't, what does that say about your campaign? Well, I think I am... Many of my colleagues were probably quite surprised that I entered this contest. Um, it's certainly something that I hadn't been thinking about for a long time, maybe unlike some of the others. So I think they're going to take a little bit of time to adjust to that. And as I said, I am the outsider in this contest. But what we need to remember is that in the SNP, it's one member and one vote. Are your ideas thought through enough? Because you, you say yourself that you haven't been considering this. Are your ideas thought through enough, do you think, to convince MSPs to support you? Well, I think the timetabling is challenging. Let's just say that. I think it is very difficult to put together a policy pla a detailed policy platform in a week. So yes, there are certainly things that will need to be looked into a little bit more. But I think the point is that if I become leader, I want to surround myself by the absolutely the best people. And leaders create other leaders. So we can create other leaders that can go out and solve the problems that we have in our NHS, um, solve the problems that we have in our economy and so on. Uh, the timetable is challenging. Is it unfair? Has it been pushed upon you? I think the timetable is, is very challenging, yes. <laughs> unfair? Well, it's not unfair in the sense that all candidates are having to adhere to it, but I think um, all the candidates would probably tell you that it's a, a very challenging timetable to be able to work towards. And finally, Ash Regan, uh, your opposition have both served in the Cabinet. Uh, you have not. Do you have the experience for such a demanding job as First Minister? So I was in the government for many years and I did attend Cabinet on a regular basis. But do you have the experience for the job? I believe I do, yes. I've Actually, been sitting and watching what's been going on in government for many years now, and I am pretty sure I have an idea on how we can fix things. Ash Regan, thanks for joining us in Scotland tonight. Thank you.